everyone. Thanks for joining the UTSA Libraries for our panel today on the voting power of Generation Z. We have a great set of panelists joining us today who we will be introducing presently. This panel is part of our pizza and research series, which consists of panels and lectures that are normally held in person with pizza, hence the name. Unfortunately, because of COVID, we currently can't hold gatherings or serve food in communal settings uh, just to ensure your safety. So this will be our first time hosting a pizza and research panel virtually. Uh, my name is Amy Bowie, and I'm the Librarian for Philosophy and Classics, the Honors College and AIS. I will be moderating this panel along with my colleague, Diane Lopez. Um, Diane, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, um, thank you, and hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Diane Lopez. I am the Scholarly Resource Librarian and also the Librarian for the College of Architecture, uh, Construction, and Planning. Um, back to you, Amy. Um, and we are also joined today by uh, Moira McKay, uh, our other colleague who is the um, Outreach Archivist for Special Collections and Archives Department. Moira will be moderating the chat for us. Uh, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce uh, our panelists. So our first panelist is Mr. Manuel Garza. He's a senior advisor with the Southwest Voter Registration Education Project. Mr. Garza has been involved in activism and civic engagement since he was a student. His work focuses on voter registration drives and get out the vote efforts throughout the country. He also works to implement proactive strategies to obtain access to health, housing, education, and um, uh, employment, business, and community economic development and political empowerment opportunities for local and minority communities. As an expert voting rights paralegal, he has conducted voting rights work across the country, including in Texas and regions in the South, the Southwest, and Midwest. He's also assisted with research in 75 different voting rights lawsuits across the nation. Our second panelist um, is Dr. Patricia Jaramillo. She is a professor um, at the Department of Public Administration here at UTSA. Dr. Jaramillo's research interests includes, of course, public administration, public policy, civic engagement with a concentration um, within the Latino population. Um, she works a lot with undergrads and she believes it's important to equip students to think critically about social and political problems and second, to provide students with information and skills to be active, engaged citizen and practitioners. Um, and our final panelist is Ms. Diana Camargo. She's a graduate student in the Department of Public Administration here at UTSA. Uh, Diana is in her third semester of a Master's of Public Administration at UTSA and is a MOVE Texas Civic Leadership Program Fellow. Uh, she graduated from UTSA with a Bachelor's in Women's Studies and attributes her upbringing to better position her to understand the impacts of a lack of representation for low-income communities. This understanding fuels her to fight for intersectional equity. And Diana believes that all beings deserve the same opportunities and representation in all spaces and is mobilizing young people to demand the change they need. She looks forward to continuing to grow and learn from others to fight for social change. Um, and with that, I'm just gonna go ahead and um, ask the first question, which is for Mr. Garza. So Mr. Garza, you've been an activist since you were a student and have done extensive work towards community empowerment and to end voter suppression. Could you tell us about that work and how it's still important and relevant, especially uh, in today's political climate? Made uh, that affect our lives daily on a daily basis. So those are things that are, are important to, to realize that as we move forward, you know, it's about implementing things, strategies and, and partnerships that work uh, as well. But if we don't have the voting capacity to make those changes, um, you know, we can, we can, we can be very uh, well-meaning, but things won't get done because there's not enough support to make those things happen. I'll give you an example of one of the things that I, that I was involved with and that had to be the San Antonio Food Bank. Uh, the San Antonio Food Bank actually uh, got started uh, by community you know, groups throughout, the, throughout Texas. And as I mentioned, Mayo, the Mexican American Youth Organization, even though our, we transitioned from Mexican American Youth Organization, Mayo to La Sunida, and back in 1971. And, and so, but, the network of, of, of people that continue to work have, has, 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 has been there all along. And so that was the network from which we built a coalition of uh, service providers throughout the state of Texas, including the community action agencies to, uh, to farm worker groups and a lot of, lot of folks to bring about legislation to create food banks. And once we got that legislation, created and it was under a Republican administration. You can't say that we don't 
work, you know, towards the better good of our community. And so we had we had Republicans that were, you know, uh, more moderate at the time. Uh, they were willing to accept, you know, uh, this strategy. To, so after we got that done, San Antonio Food Bank was the first food bank that got established in the state of Texas. And and I was part of a, putting together the grant, uh, the, the first grant that the food bank got. So I've been there with the food bank from the very start. Um, and so that's one example of a partnership that can work once you get you know the support of, of elected officials and others and community to support an issue of, of this of, of, of such importance and we did get pu pushed back back then but look what happened now with COVID. you know uh it was the the san Antonio food bank there was on national media about how badly uh COVID was was impacting our country and so those are things that that are life uh, uh our, our life to to uh, to uh, to us, you know, they're 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 living examples of what voting can do. Do I still have time? Do I add some more? Uh, yeah, you actually have a few minutes if you want to say some more. <laughs> okay. Well, Southwest Border, you know, like I mentioned, is uh, was founded back in 1974. Uh, we've, we've registered 2.7 million, you know, uh, Latinos throughout the country since then. Uh, we've trained over 150,000 uh, Latino leaders as well. And we have filed, you know, 210 lawsuits uh, in Texas and California and otherwise that we've actually won. Uh, one in, in California, the, the most recent ones were in California because we actually helped create uh, a, a Voting Rights Act for California, since the uh, United States you know, Voting Rights Act has been basically dismantled. Uh, so we saw that in California, so we were able to, to change that. Uh, we've tried to do that in Texas as well, and we'll, try, we'll keep trying. But as a result of that, uh, we have won, uh, we have 80 uh, lawsuits that we have won. Uh, but now we're up to 210, and that's a result of the losses that we have now been winning in California. So a lot of it has to do with, with what we're doing. Uh, there's 2.7 million Latinos registered to vote, but there's 2.8 million more that can be registered. Now, as far as uh, Generation Z, uh, you know, there's 800,000 persons that turn 18 every year. So the potential of, of voting into the future are tremendous. Uh, there's 8,000 Latinos born every day. And so the potential of where, where we're gonna go uh, is there. So, you know, and, and since the last presidential election here in Texas, 1.5 million new voters have come about. And so I have registered to vote. So I think that there, there's going to be closer, uh, the election in Texas is going to be closer than what some people might think. But I think that, you know, we're going to continue to, to register voters. We got till October the 5th to register voters. And so all, everything that we can you now must be done. But don't forget also that uh, the U.S. Census is very important and needs to be completed by, by everybody. We got till, September 30th, that's even closer uh, to get that done. And that's a longer discussion, but it, it's about the future and funding for, for programs for education, uh, health, uh, the redistricting that goes into place. Uh, there's, it's, a, it's got a lot of consequences that, that uh, uh, as a result of the, of, the, of the census. And of course, uh, we had to fight the issue about uh, allowing non-citizens to be counted uh, when the census is taken to count everybody in the United States at the time, uh, citizen or non-citizen. And so that is something that uh, th this administration, current administration was trying to, to stop from doing, but hopefully uh, we'll continue. But there's a lot of misinformation coming from this White House and uh, don't be intimidated by it. Register to vote and, and please vote. All right, thank you, Mr. Garza. So we're going to um, move on to our second question now. 
So this question is for Dr. Jaramillo. Uh, so based on your research and your work, um, and your work or your research work, and also as an educator with undergrads, um, what what issues like what issues do you focus on in your class, especially when it pertains to voting, and that we and our students should be aware of? So a lot of what we talk about in class, and even if we're not talking about elections at the at the moment, something that we like to emphasize is generational divides. Um, and how there are differences in terms of policy perceptions or opinions and attitudes towards policy um, related to different generations. So for example, um, there are differences of opinion in terms of the role of government. So how active government should be. Um, the youth tend to believe that government should provide more services than those who are older, for example, um, and gender, race, kinds of issues. There are difference of perceptions between the generations. So something that I like to tell my students is your parents and grandparents are most likely going to turn out to vote. Um, so if you don't, they're making your decisions, they're making decisions for you instead of allowing you a voice. So having that voice is actually really, really important. Also, I wanted, I like to give them factual information. So for example, CIRCLE, which is a center at Tufts University for Civic Learning and Engagement, they reported as of the end of August that 20 states reported more young people registering to vote than even leading up to the 2016 election, which is really important. Texas is reporting an increase of 13%. Also, they're reporting, however, as, as of the beginning of, or the end of January, something that was notable was a lack of mobilization among the youth. So campaigns were less likely to actually contact the youth in terms of turning out to vote. And that tends to be substantial because you are more likely to turn out to vote if you've been contacted by a campaign. So those things are actually really important for students to consider, Generation Z to consider. Um, but also just kind of the basics of how you do it. How is it that you actually go about registering to vote? Uh, what do you do when election day rolls around or if you want to vote early? So we, I think I provided you all a number of different kinds of nonprofit organizations that provide information. Uh, Move Texas, Diana's organization, um, Texas Rising, also Legal Women Voters. Also, the Bear County website provides information in terms of registering to vote, but we're getting close to that deadline. So we need to make sure that if you're interested in registering to vote here in Bear County, you need to do it soon. Um, a lot of that can be, the help can be available there um, through what you all are, are loading on the library website. You do have to be 18, you do have to be a citizen, you need to reside in the county. Um, really nice for UTSA is that UTSA is going to be a voting site. So for early voting, for election day, all you have to do is go to campus at 1604. So we're really fortunate that in that way, we can shortcut some of that information in terms of trying to find out where you actually go to vote. So students should find that as a really nice way to um, make it accessible. So another element is actually, <laughs> figuring out what you have to bring on election day. So that's part of that fundamental information. So tech, we do have a voter ID law in effect here in Texas. So you have to make sure that you have a valid form of ID. That information is also provided on the Bear County website, the Texas Secretary of State's website in their election division. Um, the Texas driver's license, um, a US passport, and their our other valid forms, a handgun license, concealed handgun license is also accepted and military IDs are also accepted. So finding out what those seven accepted forms of ID are, are very important. Students cannot register the day of the election. You have to be registered 30 days in advance. So again, you need to get that registration taken care of sooner rather than later. Then when it comes to actually voting on election day, there is information on the Bear County website that will actually give you a sample ballot and will let you see that your, your registration has gone through. So you can plug in that information and find out who is actually on your ballot. You can spend some time looking up information about preferred candidates or any other kind of provision that may be there. 
So vote by mail has been an area of confusion. And I think it's really important to address this with students as well, especially because the US Postal Service sent out that little postcard that said vote by mail is secure. And in doing so, it may have created confusion for Texans. So those of us here in Bear County need to recognize we have very limited vote by mail opportunities. And actually most of us don't qualify. So most of us need to be willing to show up in person, um, social distance, wear our masks, and in order to do our part. There are safety measures that are being taken. It's my understanding from talking to UTSA leadership um, that Bear County has done a very good job of talking about how to make sure that the voting sites um, are secure in terms of health concerns. So providing um, pencils or glove options in terms of voting, social distance at the polls. Um, and certainly, um, I know I will be wearing my mask, so. Okay. Like yeah, no, I love, bit. yeah. Yeah, I'd like to follow up a little bit on that, because, you know, uh, it, it's important, Dr. Jaramillo is very uh, correct about everything that you mentioned. And, and uh, but do please take time to, to register to vote. Uh, if you're going to be 18 on the election day, but you're not 18 yet, you can register to vote. So please register to vote even if you're not 18 yet, but you will be 18 on the election day, please register to vote because you don't have to be 18 to register to vote. You can be 17 and, and months, but make sure that you're gonna be 18 on the election day. So you can register to vote. And the social, social distancing at the polls, uh, since I voted early and voted in person uh, for the primaries, I noticed, and I went to the election department, to the actual election office to vote because our office is about four blocks away from the elections department uh, uh, headquarters for the county. And I went, I walked over there to vote, but they were not socially distancing. And, and, and so, but COVID had not hit. But the other thing was that, uh, that the voting booths were too close together. And so uh, anybody could, could see what you were doing. And so what the Bear County had done was ask those who were waiting in line to vote to turn their backs to the voters that were actually voting in the, the, the voting booths. But not everybody was paying attention. So that's a problem. And I did, I, I did talk to Jackie immediately after that and said, Jackie, you need to take care of that because there's people complaining about that their voting is not safe, it's not secure because people are, can, can see what they're doing. And so, and she said, well, we don't have enough space. Well, said, make sure that you take care of it. That was the first day of early voting. So uh, there's things like that, that you know, will discourage people from voting because of, of what's up there. So hopefully, because of COVID, more precautions are have been taken uh, are are in place, and and uh, and I hope to see a voter, a good voter turnout. Uh, Southwest voter uh, was part of making sure that UTSA was a, a early voting site years back, and it continues to be uh, something we advocate for, uh, not only UTSA but. Uh, I believe that all the colleges and universities should be early voting sites. Um, uh, that includes all the Alma colleges, you know, campuses. Uh, and so, but that is something that, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a continuous work to make sure that we have the infrastructure in place to make sure that we have a good election uh, and participation by, by the voters. So that's the only thing I would like to add to what Dr. Jaramillo said. All right, thank you, Mr. Garza. Uh, right, real quick, just briefly before we move on to the, the next question, um, I just wanted to mention like that the reason we're doing this panel uh, at the end of September, even though the election is in November, is because we want you to make the uh, voter registration deadline, which is October 5th. So I just wanted, uh, Dr. Jaramillo already pointed out, but just wanted to um, emphasize that again, it's October 5th. So you have, um, I don't know, I think it's like a week and a half or something, two weeks, a week yeah. and a half. You have a week and a half week to and register, half. so you have some time. Um, and anyways, um, so Di um, Diane, I think you're asking the next question, right? So I guess we'll move on now. Yeah, uh, so uh, uh, for Diana, um, 
as a Move Texas fellow and as a student, um, can you talk, like, I would love to hear your, your journey in how you have balanced your coursework, your civic engagement, also what sparked all this for, for you to be so involved at a young age? Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, so for me, it was easy, but before I even start talking about that, I think what got me even civically engaged was like, I'm a daughter of immigrant parents. I'm also a queer Latina woman, so that's already like three strikes, right? Like people don't really want that. Uh, but I do remember when I was in fifth grade, I asked my teacher at the time, and I was like, um, girls can be stronger than boys, right? And he said no. So from that moment, I was like, hmm what and so i started questioning a lot of things around me like why was my school the way it was why were people unequal like why was the world like that um then i think that being a woman studies major really pushed that even further um being in a classroom and learning about inequalities and seeing how this system wasn't working for underrepresented communities uh really pushed me to just i had to I couldn't just like stop it as soon as I walked out of the door of the classroom. I had to be part of something. Um, and during that time, I came across a quote by Mother Teresa that said, I alone cannot change the world, but I can cast a stone across the waters to create many ripples. Um, and I feel like when we do like a domino effect, like everyone is part of that, um, it's a domino piece. Um, so I wanted to be part, I wanted to be a domino piece. Um, so from that, then I started to uh, try to get involved and be part of something. So I joined the wo uh, Women in Leadership Student Organization on campus. I joined the Hispanic Student Association, where I had a leadership position, and I was able to uh, create a panel about coming out as a Latinx person. Um, but something that really, really like sparked everything of what I want to do for the rest of my life was Move Texas. Um, they l taught me the importance of voting. They also helped me understand the right way to vote. <laughs> and just the importance of this work of getting young people registered to vote and being part of this political process. Um, yeah, so when I was younger, uh, my dad always told me that my vote represented my family because I'm a daughter of immigrant parents. So I registered to vote at the age of 18 without knowing how to vote or how that process works. So I would just walk in the booth and I was like, okay, if they're a woman or a minority, I'm in whatever happens, I hope for the best. Um, that's probably not the right way to vote at all. But MOVE definitely shifted that narrative. Um, I learned how to have an educated vote. I learned what a voter guide was. I never heard of a voter guide. Um, also, I learned about issue-based voting. Instead of voting for a candidate because of who they are and how they represent themselves, look at the issues that that candidate is really um, putting forward. It's not about uh, who the candidate is, but the issues that they're trying to represent and what best intentions they have for you and, um, and what you want the world to be changed. Um, also, uh, MOVE made me really annoying. Like my social media, I'm like, are you registered? Are your current address? When are you voting? Do you have a plan? Uh, my roommates, I've told them, are you registered? Did you register? Did you register? They're probably annoyed, but like, these are things that we need to do. Uh, yeah, and so, when I was asked to be in this panel, I think the first thing that I went, that I asked myself was like, what is voting, right? Like, what is voting? And so I went on Google and I was like, what is voting? And that definitely did not help. There was a lot of different articles and I was like, yeah, no. So I, um, I think that voting is a right for, to have our voices heard and be part of the conversation of what we want to happen in this country. Um, we want change. So for me, voting is empowerment. It's about being part of that change because change needs your voice and your voice is your vote. Um, as young people, we need to start voting now because at the end of the day, once you vote once, you're just gonna continue voting for the rest of your life. And honestly, we're gonna inherit this country. We're gonna be the decision makers at one point. So why not just start voting now instead of trying to play catch up when we're the old people uh, voting. Sorry to any old folks that are here. I apologize, but you know, like it's, a, it's known for old people games. So we're going to be those old people making those decisions. So why not just be part of the conversation now? So when we're in that conversation, when we're in that position, we're already evolving into something else. Also, our vote is representation, right? Um, we need people in government that reflect everyone in the United States, right? We need people in government that represent everyone that's even in this panel today. Um, but for example, uh, San Antonio City Council has the most women ever elected to city council. Um, Lina Hidalgo is the first woman 
first Latina uh, to ever be part of, uh, to be Harris County judge. She's also an immigrant. She was born in Bogota, Colombia, right? Um, New York uh, has Catalina Cruz. Uh, she's a dreamer. She's the first dreamer to ever be elected to Congress. Um, we also have the most diverse Congress in history. Um, but today we're talking about young people and we can't like not talk about Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez. She's the youngest person to ever be elected to Congress and she's a voice for young people um, in Congress. Um, and I think talking about representation, I think Lena Hidalgo really put it in really great words. She said, we have got to include all uh, our voices in our democracy. That's how we preserve uh, democracy. That's how we build accountable government. And that's how we build response, uh, responsive democracy. I think if we all have, are part of those conversations, then our government is gonna be a reflection of who we are instead of what we're seeing today. Um, we have seen a change and there's more representation so much more for us to go. And then there's that, you know, the popular question that everyone asks, well, young people don't vote. Well, actually, since 2014, uh, young people have increased a voter turnout and they've been part of this conversation. Um, young people are getting more young people to vote. Uh, so being just a young person during this time is really interesting and really impactful because we're Instead of waiting for the change to be given to us, we need to start taking charge and take that change instead of waiting for someone to give it to us. Um, because of that, then we're gonna be in the same thing over and over again. But if you need, uh, you sh if you need to register to vote or you need to uh, uh, look up your re uh, voter registration uh, update, go to movetexas.org slash register. Uh, I know that Texas uh, is not an online uh, voter uh, state, but we do have an offer to get people uh, to register through by mail. So we just send you a uh, pre uh, printed out uh, voter registration where you get it in the mail. And all you have to put is either your four last digits of your social and your uh, ID or whatever. And then you sign the data and put it back in the mail and you're registered. Or if you want to be part of the movement, get more young people to vote. Uh, we also have uh, volunteer opportunities with Move Texas. Thank you. No, and that's like super important. Like knowing that we have an organization here in San Antonio called Move Texas that is where how um, Diana got involved is something that, you know, I think a lot of our undergrads should look into because they have that great fellowship program to allow students to kind of explore this realm of what does it mean to promote voting in our community. Uh, but yeah. Pass it on to Amy. Can I just comment that Drew Galloway, who runs Move Texas, is actually one of um, out of public administration at UTSA. So we have a number of students from UTSA who are actually represented at that particular organization. I took a class with Drew in at SAC. We were both <laughs> SAC students together, and I don't, I don't, I, I, I don't see him, but I know I remember him. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we have, um, I guess, a few um, minutes for us to ask like a second question to the panelists before we move on to actual Q&A with the audience. Um, so uh, for Mr. Garza, um, so what I always I, what I always tell people is that, so I am from California, but I am from a red county in a blue state. Um, I've never voted the way my, my own county voted. So basically I've, um, what I say is like, I've registered to vote since my 18th birthday and I voted in only losing elections for the past 12 years. So, um, and despite that, like, I mean, it gets um, annoying, irritating sometimes, but like, you know, you just, you keep going, right? So I know you've worked on many, um, projects, um, many uh, reform efforts over the years. And like you mentioned, like you've had uh, a lot of successes, which is awesome. But um, I know along the way, there have been probably failures and disappointments as well. So just real quick, like, would you be able to like talk to um, the audience like about maybe like a, an example of a time when something that you worked on failed and how you kind of picked yourself up and moved past that? First of all, we've never failed. <clears throat> we have never failed. Uh, our efforts might have gone derailed, but you know, by the powers to be, but we have never failed. And, uh, and so uh, there's been dis disappointments. Uh, for example, public uh, public funding for 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 schools, you know, 
equity funding for public schools in Texas. That still hasn't been hasn't been uh, uh, fully completed. I, I know that when uh, I was part of the walkout in 1968, I was 17 years old. That's how I got involved. So it is. I mean, uh, Dana, Ms. Camargo is correct. You know, if we don't take control of, of of our future now, and I'm speaking to Generation Z, if we don't take control of our your your future and our future, because we're going to be dependent on what you all do as well going into the future, uh, it's going to be a you're going to be behind the eight ball. So uh, I, I emphasize the fact that you know uh, I, I I believe that uh, because as, as a, I'm still young at heart, and and think of it think of it that way, uh, because you know it is about engaging younger people in the process. Uh, I can go and tell you about. Uh, my grandfather and my my great uncles and and how they were influential on me about getting involved and and so uh, because they were part of the they 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 were part of Mexico at the time uh, during the Mexican Revolution and so when they came to the United States uh, they had a real sense of civic engagement and they impressed that up upon us at a very young age. And so uh, we learn from our for, from our from our elders. You know, we we stand on their shoulders, and we're here to stand on the shoulders of the younger generations to come. So we've got a lot to 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 share, a lot of things that that we have encountered in the past that should serve as as uh, as, as as landmines that you need to avoid. Uh, so you will not be able to. Uh, Get caught up in in, in 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 misinformation like what's going on right now. Uh, let's talk about facts. Let's talk about the real issues. Um, uh, you know, if if more if more Mexicanos, for example, more Hispanics were to vote, you know, there would be a thirty percent increase in Democratic you know participation by Latinos because about thirty percent uh, that vote Republican or male uh, Mexicanos. And the issue is what? Abortion. And there's something bigger, I think, that that needs to be fully uh, understood. That it's about income inequality that, that's out there that that forces us to have make choices that that uh, that some some people might see as unpopular. But going back to to that issue. Uh, that's a driving issue within our community, and and so. Uh, but if, if we're to to convince people like in California, uh, we convinced Latino males, their best interest was in economic equality versus, you know, your position on abortion. You as a family can make that decision, but there's bigger issues. That are impacting the whole community, the whole population, and so that's how we change things around in California uh, to get more people engaged on the real issues, on the real issues that that not saying that abortion is not a real issue because it is, but there's bigger issues, and and uh, hopefully you're not from Orange County uh, in California, but uh, because that has been a red county for for a long time and it's, it's changing so but uh there's a lot to do lot lots more to do and to consider uh, and, and the importance of voting thank you for your remarks on that uh, mr garza it, very true to that and um i we have a second question for diana um, and so something that you kind of spoke right now about, um, especially being a, a child of immigrants, right? And this aspect of voting um, was something that I was raised up also with, right? Um, where my mom, you know, she didn't have, she wasn't a citizen. And so her, she always reminded us being American means that we have this right to vote. And having that kind of similar story, you know, we, there's probably a lot of us that ha come from this immigrant background and this kind of sense of responsibility to be the voice of our immigrant community 
um, while we should just be uplifting our voices. But at the same time, it's like, how do we, you know, as children of immigrant or of a family that's still not very strongly voted or being young, you know, like what are, what are steps or steps that we can take, um, you know, or what steps that you recommend for um, our, you know, our younger voters um, to take to become more civically engaged um, with, with really honestly with right now with this political climate, but also, you know, where we, where it continues, it's just something that we build on. Yeah, um, I think that a good way is to look at what issues you care about, right? So if you care about the planet and climate change, then try to find ways that you can um, help into those issues and vote in that way. I think um, after uh, being a voter, it's part of who you are, right? First, uh, you have to vote, right? You Once you vote, you're going to vote for the rest of your life. And so just having to be like involved in the issues that you care about and kind of mixing like your life with what uh like your experiences in life and then voting in that way is really uh is it's a really good way to continue to be civically engaged and having other young people to be engaged as well um i think that being an immigrant daughter i think well my family in colombia are very always they always voted so my dad kind of engraved that I had to vote um, and then that my vote mattered a lot more than I thought, but I was young and no one taught me what voting is. So just using an issue that you really deeply care about uh, that you feel that like this is something that's really important can really make you part of this process of being a voter and being part of the being civilly engaged and being part of your community and helping the community that you represent. Um, because once you're a voter, you're always going to be a voter as part of who you are. And it's, a, it's, your, it's your right as a citizen of this country. So you should definitely just take charge of it and have your voices heard. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, it's definitely important, uh, in my opinion, to stay engaged even after ele the elections are over because it's, you know, I, I know we all have a tendency to kind of gravitate towards voting in um, what I've heard called like referred to as the big sexy elections, the ones that come every two to four years. So those are the ones everybody wants to vote um, like in and, um, and some people will only vote in those elections. And the problem with that is like at that time, sometimes you go in and you're like, oh no, I don't know what all these propositions mean. You don't know kind of the history of individual candidates. Like some people have like a kind of a, almost a genealogy um, that you can trace back like, you know, in this big election, they're running for Senator, but what did they do back then? But if you had um, maybe voted in the smaller local elections before you might have known like maybe that before he was mayor or you know she uh, worked for the school board and you would be familiar with the policies that they worked with back then and whether or not you agree with that um, I think with COVID it's become much more transparent and evident like um, the importance of local government um, like you know your mayor your um, you know sheriff the judge the, um, like, the the school board things like that like those decisions are made in the local level so just something to keep in mind uh, even even um, like regardless of how this election turns out this big one in November uh, regardless of that like um, just keep in mind um, that you can still stay you know, active and participate afterwards. Um, okay, so with that, I'm gonna move on to the um, uh, next question for uh, Dr. Jaramillo. So let me, um, oh my God, I had it right here. All right, so um, uh, Dr. Jaramillo, are there any current, um, I guess, like policies um, related to voting or the elections that students who are maybe interested in doing further research on this, these issues can, can look into that you're aware of? Uh, yes, actually, we, I have a number of graduate and undergraduate students who've expressed interest in a number of different kinds of policy and administrative questions related to voting or election law or election rules. So a lot of what we're concerned about are what are the rules and regulations that structure why people vote or what incentivize um, or disincentivize uh, why people vote. And so what are the structures that are in place? Um, a lot of those questions, um, they vary. You can think about where are the placement of polls within a county? Um, is it accessible? Is it easy for a person to get to the poll? Uh, what are the rules and regulations related to registering to vote? Uh, and oftentimes we hear on the national news that um, examples of other states where they can walk in, register to vote and vote that same day. Whereas here in Texas, we have that 30 day in advance registration requirement. 
So um, a lot of the rules and regulations, thinking about generational issues. So a lot of our um, younger students are actually so savvy when it comes to technology. There are all kinds of issues when it comes to, techno uh, to technology and security. Um, but are there kinds of mechanisms for securing the vote electronically anymore? Um, and I think that's a really big question as opposed to turning out to vote. Are there methods for recount? What are the, what are the variations across the different states um, related to laws uh, for recounting an election when an election is really close? Um, also, even thinking about, I had a question from a student asking about um, comparisons within the state of Texas in terms of how the different counties run their um, election, um, early election day and election day. So asking about whether or not Bear County has a 24 hour uh, polling place, which we don't, um, but they start hearing about it in other counties or in other states. And so making sure that that information is, um, how available is it, how accessible is it, um, tends to be an area of, of uh, investigation for some students as well. Provisional ballots um, are a big question whether or not they're counted, um, how they impact an election, whether they could be impacting an election because a provisional ballot, uh, somebody could walk in without their identification and cast a provisional ballot, but if they don't show back up with their ID, their vote is not counted. So understanding a lot of those in terms of what's required, um, what are those rules that are actually in place? Um, comparisons across county, voter suppression, lawsuits, generational divides, um, all of those. Uh, the legal women voters, a lot of the um, policy issues that are of concern are highlighted uh, by a lot of our uh, nonprofit organizations, ACLU, Southwest Voter, LULAC, um, you name it, uh, MOVE, and, and a lot of other organizations highlighting generational, those might, that might be specific um, or more more relevant to women or race, ethnicity, uh, race, ethnic, or other kinds of issues, your particular kinds of, of advocacy groups will highlight those kinds of issues. And sometimes that's a really good starting point in terms of finding the information that might be of interest to you. There's All right, thank you. That was super informative. Oh, yeah, sorry, Mr. Garza, go ahead. Uh, there's a couple of questions that uh, from the chat. Uh, one is, I think there's a, a lot of disconnect, especially of minorities. Uh, we're told by older people in our families that our vote doesn't count. Well, I'll stop there because the the, the comment is, is longer than that. But that's been intentional from the get-go. Uh, when when uh, the country established uh, uh, who could register to vote, it was white men only specific white men, a specific you know, group of white men, landowners could only be white male landowners could be registered to vote. And so that's changed a long time. Uh, of course, with uh, I, you know, ERA come around and, and, and the 19th Amendment, women got the right to vote. And, 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 and so that needs to be included. I mean, uh, Native Americans didn't they, they become citizens. We're, considered citizens till the 1920s. Uh, the Voter Registration uh, uh, Act was in 1965. Mexicanos, Spanish speakers were not included in the Voting Rights Act till three years later. Uh, so that is something that, that you know, people need to be aware of. This has been intentional to, to, uh, to keep us from voting. So we need to overcome all those, all those myths uh, the, within ourselves and have conversation. Uh, if you, if you can, or do you get all of your relatives to vote, you know, from home? Uh, you can do a, a potluck and talk about the candidates and then go to your rooms or, and, and, um, and, and, and fill out your ballot and, and mail it in. Uh, you still have the privacy of your home to, to cast your vote. Make it a family discussion. Make it a, a discussion with your, with, your, with your peers. Now, another question is about, uh, do we ever think that online voting will occur? Well, it does in Mexico. Mexico already votes electronically. So why can't we? Uh, and so there's, there's, there's not, there's issues that, that should be addressed now that are not being addressed because it's about maintaining power by the powers to be. And so we have to undo that. 
we have to take charge of making sure our future and our you know uh, family's futures uh, are, are intact uh, you know for, for, for years to come. This is a great country and we have to protect this democracy this great, great country of ours. And so we, we, we need to make sure that everybody gets to, to speak out uh, and, and gets hurt and get to voice their, their opinion by voting. So there's other ways of doing it as, as we all know, but uh, this is right now, this is the major task that we got uh, uh, to, to undertake is making sure people come out to vote on, on, on November 3rd. Register vote by October 5th, fill out your, your the census by September 30th. Um, so, but there's more to that than that, as we all know. Yes, um, I definitely agree with all of that. Um, I also wanted to point out that it's very astonishing how recent some of these changes like uh, were made, like uh, the rights that were granted to certain like minority groups, like didn't happen until the twenty, um, yeah, the twentieth century. Like I was born in the twentieth century; it was not that long before you know my time. So, um, so basically, it's like it's something uh, to note for sure. And also, I would um, think I would recommend if you're interested in like um, how elections work in other countries, like look into like. Um, I guess the voting requirements in different countries. Like I know I have relatives in Australia and I know over there it's mandatory to vote. If you don't vote, you're fined. So it's very um, fascinating to see how different countries handle elections versus the way we do it. Um, yeah, like I, um, I guess like I'll, um, we should, um, we'll, we'll give a chance um, to Dr. Jaramillo and um, Diana to answer those questions too if, um, if you want to. Uh, basically uh, the, uh, Desiree was asking um, about the disconnect and how you engage your families in those conversations. So like, for example, for me, like I know, like I said, like in, in California, like you get to vote by mail. So they mail you your sample ballot ahead of time. They mail you the booklet with the information. And then, so what my family and I do is like, we sit down and we actually help each other with research. So like, you know, I'm a nerd, so like I'm a librarian. So I basically go through like these a couple nights before and I'll like um, look up the prop and like my sister and I divide it. So she'll take half, I take half and go, prop 32, what's your opinion on this? And then she'll go, I'm voting this. And I go, why? And she basically backs up. And like, I'm thinking that is a very good, like here I know you don't get your mail and ballot ahead of time. You can definitely still see what is on going to be on the ballot, even though you have to go in person to vote. So. Uh, maybe like um, a good way to engage your family or get them involved is to do it that way. Like just sit down, all of you research it together, like an assignment. <laughs> and then by, by the time you go into the polls on the day of, you will be informed. Um, that's my strategy. So that's um, a bit of advice I have. Yeah, and, and, and bring some food, you know, make, make it make it entertaining, make it make it uh, bring your family and have everybody bring some some uh, potluck and have a have a make a make a, a party of it. And, and then vote. Yeah. Well, and, and Diana actually, I'm sorry, Mr. Garza, Diana actually um, introduced some of this topic as well in thinking about how to engage. And that's you know, part of what we do in our, um, here at UTSA, a lot of it is focused on that civic engagement element, which means talking, um, learning how to talk about issues that can sometimes be very controversial. And um, and then introducing those conversations. So that becomes really difficult, but it's a willingness to actually step out there into that space. And it's a really uncomfortable space to be in, especially if you're one of the people who may be in the minority. So remember that idea of uh, what religion and politics are off limits. And so it's getting past that idea that religion and politics need to be off limits um, because people are making decisions. Um, in religion and politics. And in politics, it's a day-to-day, -day, it affects our day-to-day -day lives, whether we like it or not. It's whether or not those potholes are filled in our neighborhood. It's whether or not we get resources in our neighborhoods. And those are determined by our elected, by our elected officials. So if we're not participating, and if we're not engaging our families in those conversations and showing them on a day-to-day -day basis, hey, wait a minute, but what about, we do need a stoplight on that corner. Well, that's local government and helping our families to understand where, um, how it impacts us, I think, can really start that conversation. Diana, right? Yeah, uh, yeah I, I believe that, I mean, me and my father also have conversations and we disagree a lot on things, especially with 
the voting election this year, uh, we had different views, but I think having those conversations and seeing well, like what other family members come from can really help you understand why they have those decisions and what you have, the decisions that you have. Uh, voting is being, voting and being civically engaged is supposed to be fun, right? Like if you go vote, like take your family with you, take your best friend with you, like after, like go and um, eat, right? Um, I think MOVE does a really good thing. We had used to have party in the polls, but sadly because of COVID, we can't have those things. And we have like a DJ and like pizza and stuff because being voting is supposed to be fun. It's, it's great, right? We all have that opportunity to do that. Um, so we should definitely do that. Um, somewhat uh, the question about uh, election voting happening online, I think that that should happen. But I think right now, like we're in a mission to get Texas to have online voter registration and actually uh, move Texas suit the state over this and we actually won. So um, actually the state of Texas has until uh, September 23rd to change their system um, because the core rule that since Texas offered online uh, driver's license renewal, they must also offer online voter registration. So let's see what happens in September 23 uh, when uh, the system is updated. All right, so we're coming to the end of our hour and I really want to say thank you for our panelists and for everybody to attend on this. Um, if if any of our participants have any additional questions or anything like that, uh, would our panelists be able to share either your social media account or an email so our panelists have a way to contact you and be able to ask you questions um, that they wanted to ask you that we, unfortunately, we didn't have enough time to do in this hour since, you know, it's, a, you know, we have, um, a large, you know, we, it, this is such an important topic and, you know, I wish we could have more time to talk about it, but um, being just respectful and mindful for um, everybody's time, um, would our panelists be able to share um, a method of communication or contact? For uh, Diane and I will also create um, like a, a resource guide after this, like, and we will um, basically put all the, the resources that were shared in the chat on there and, and additional ones too, um, that we think will be in, uh, helpful to you before the election. So we'll go ahead and get on that and uh, we will, uh, we will share that with um, everybody who has registered for um, the, the panel today. Uh, I also, um, this is, and I've noticed like this is recording. I started it a bit late, so I cut off the introductions, but I'll add the introductions back in uh, when I post um, the recording. All the important stuff after that is there. So it, um, that will be posted uh, presently. Um, and I guess we have uh, four more minutes. So like if um, any uh, of our panelists want to, like if you have any closing remarks, like just one last brief message you wanna leave everybody with, um, you can go ahead and say it now. <laughs> Yeah, if you haven't registered to vote, you have till October 5th to register to vote. And if you need somewhere to register, go to movetexas.org slash register. It's super important to be civically engaged and vote at every single election because every election has it. Something is going to be important of you, especially local elections, because as soon as you walk in your front door, uh, those laws and stuff already are into effect and they affect you. So you should totally, uh, and then take all your friends and family. If they don't want to be like, you have to, it's our civic duty to uh, register to vote. Okay, uh, again, Ms. Camargo is correct about everything that you just mentioned. And again, you know, one of the things, October, October 5th is a uh, deadline to register to vote. So make sure you do that right now. Uh, when you go vote, if you're going to vote by mail, make sure you make your request uh, prior to the election day. You have to make sure that your uh, request goes in at least 11 days before. Uh, but actually, try to do it now if you're going to vote by mail. Uh, I don't see where uh, the county or the state is going to be ask, following up on, on, on everybody that makes a request to vote by mail. Uh, because it's almost impossible to verify everybody that they have a, some sort of illness uh, and that it's, it's just too problematic uh, of an issue for them to go and, and find out everybody who's requested a, a, a application by mail is, is, is sick because basically that's the only criteria the state has. Uh, but if you can, 
vote early, vote in person, take all the precautions you need to take uh, to do so. Uh, and But please vote. Please register to vote by October 5th. Please complete the census uh, form by September 30th. Again, that those are very important dates, very important things that need to happen. And if your family has not done that, you know, you, I'm sure you talk to your parents or your, your relatives and ask them if they have done that. If they have it, please fill out the census, please register to vote, and please vote on November 3rd. I want to actually thank the UTSA library because y'all are awesome in every way always there in terms of providing resources for those of us in the UTSA community. So thank you so much. Early voting starts, of course, um, we mentioned before October 13th, um, election day. I don't think we're gonna overlook it. It's gonna be everywhere in the news, but it's November 3rd. Um, I am happy to help however I can, but thank you UTSA librarians and library community. All right, thank you everyone. We're just gonna um, end right there. That was a fantastic discussion. And again, if everybody, anyone has any questions or um, you know, wants to reach out to the panelists, their information is in the chat box right there. Um, all right, thank you for coming to our panel. Yes, thank you everybody. And then we'll give you, um, once we have our, our guide with all the resources that our panelists offer, we'll, we'll email it and send it off on to social media too. Why not, right? Um, but yeah, thank you everybody for joining and have a great rest of the day.